Hello, as promised, a short video on dbscan. dbscan stands for Density Based Spatial Clustering with Noise, dbscan, and it was invented by Esther Dahl in 1996. dbscan has become my personal, my favorite clustering algorithm. It is really, really cool and has many nice advantages over, for example, k-means or Gaussian mixture models. dbscan has two parameters, epsilon and m, and the way it works is as follows. So the first thing you look at epsilon, epsilon is some small constant. And let's say this here on the left is my data set. So for now, just look at the, you know, these points, right? Ignore the graph and the coloring and all this stuff. So this is my data set. And the very first thing you do is you take your data set and you convert it into a nearest neighbor graph. And the way you do this is you take any single data point, you draw an epsilon ball around it, distance epsilon, and you look at all the points that are inside of it, and these become your nearest neighbors. And points that are outside of it do not become nearest neighbors. So the nearest neighbor, you know, when you have dense region of the graph, you have a lot of nearest neighbors. And if you have sparse region, of, you know, then in your data, point, data set, then you actually have no nearest neighbors. For example, this guy here has no nearest neighbors because there's nothing inside of an epsilon ball. Okay, so you do this, for example, this guy, right? these are, you know, these points are all within its nearest, within epsilon distance, so these are all the nearest neighbors, this guy also, then this guy here has only two nearest neighbors, this guy here has, you know, and so on, multiple nearest neighbors, and so on, and so you build this whole graph, and um, that's the very first thing you do to the DP scan. Then the second thing you do is you take the second constant, m equals three, and you define core points. And the definition is very simple. Any data point that has a degree, which is also the same thing as number of nearest neighbors, greater than m, greater equal m, is a core point. In this case, I drew them all as red points. So for example, this guy here has one, two, three, four, five nearest neighbors. Five is more than three, so it is a core point. This guy has one, two, three nearest neighbors. Three is greater equal three, so it's, yes, it's also a core point. This guy, one, two, three, core point. This guy, one, two, three, core point. This guy has only one nearest neighbor, not a core point, right? Not cool enough. This guy, not a core point, only two nearest neighbors. So again, you compute this for every single data point and you get all your core points. These are here, these red, you know, red points. <clears throat> now you've done all the pre-processing. Now we can start with the clustering. And the clustering essentially, um, follows a simple principle. The first thing you do is you pick a random core point. For example, this guy here on the left. This is now my random core point, and I assign it to cluster one. So this here, let's call this cluster one. So right now I have cluster one and only consists of one point, this core point here. And here comes the clustering rule. Any data point that is connected with a core point, it's important that it's core, that's already in a cluster will also become part of the cluster. So all of these guys also become part of the cluster, right? Because they're all connected to this guy here. And be because it's a core point, all its neighbors can come in. It's a little like it's a party and only the core points are allowed to bring their friends with them to the party. Now, you know, this, this core point led in these, these, these different points, but this guy here also came in with it. And this is again, a core point. So this point here let, you know, can let its friends in. So we have these two points that also come in uh, because they're friends with this core point. Now we have this core point in, in the cluster. And now again, all of its friends can come in, right? So now we have these points as well, part of the core, uh, cluster. Again, two more core points. They let their friends in. So they are also part of the cluster. And this core point lets this point in. So this is now the last point that's led into the cluster. So if you draw the cluster line, you'll notice that this here is exactly the cluster line. All of these points inside the green circle are part of the cluster. It's important that this point here is not part of the cluster. Why? It has a friend that's in the cluster, but this here, not a core point. Only core points can bring their friends to the cluster. All right, so at this point, we have run out of neighbors that we can let in. And what we do is we just, you know, repeat the process. We start, we pick a new uh, core point at random, for example, this guy down here. 
Okay, we say, all right, this guy down here is part of cluster number two. Cluster two. Yeah, this is cluster two. And we do the same thing. This guy has, you know, a whole bunch of nearest neighbors, can bring them all with them to the party. Now this core point has a bunch of neighbors, can let them all in. This core point can let this guy in, and this core point can let this guy in. And before you notice it, you realize all of these points belong to cluster number two. Now we would again pick a random class, uh, core point, but there aren't any core points left. So what we do now is we take all the points at this stage that have not been assigned to any cluster and call them noise. So these are just noise points. Basically, they are not part of the cluster structure. We just, they're kind of in their own category. One thing that's also interesting to see is this point here in the middle could really be in either one of the clusters, but because cluster one was assigned first, this point basically joined the party of this core point and couldn't join the party anymore here because it was already assigned somewhere else. Every point can only be in one cluster. That's sometimes why the first cluster is maybe a little bit bigger than subsequent clusters. I should draw a little circle around this guy. And that's all there is to dbscan. I can now show you this a little bit on uh, so you have a noisy smiley face. And min points here is four, epsilon is one. Let's get started. And the first thing it does is picks a random core point and lets all its neighbors into the into the cluster. Then, you know, once they're all done, it picks a second core point and defines a, a new cluster. This is the blue one now, or the second cluster. And again, lets in all its neighbors. You can see how this can bottom up creeps around and um, captures the circular cluster very, very well which is something k-means could never do, right? Because k-means basically assumes that the whole circle inside of it must be a cluster. It can't just be a circle. It must be filled with points. And now it assigns a third cluster and a fourth cluster. And now it's done with all the core points and everything that's here with the black circle is a noise point. And look how beautifully dbscan nailed this pretty challenging cluster structure. If you do this, take the same data set and run k-means on it. You can now do this, add a centroid. One, two, three, four. Let's tell it how many clusters there are. There are four clusters. So we give k-means in some set an advantage. Right? We tell it how many clusters there are, and we start assigning centroids. Um, you can see here, what does it do? It just basically divides the space up into five clusters. It's completely oblivious to the true cluster structure. Of course, you know, we're beating up k-means here, but k-means actually, you know, does work very nicely when its assumptions are satisfied. But one thing I like about dbscan so much is that it doesn't make as many assumptions. So in practice, it can sometimes be more robust and, you know, bring out cluster structure even in challenging data sets.